Next, remarks from Brigadier General Roger Turner on the current situation in Afghanistan. He recently led a team that trained and advised the Afghan National Army and discussed that earlier today at the Brookings Institution. This is an hour. Welcome to Brookings. Happy holiday weekend. I'm Michael Hanlon with the Foreign Policy Program, and I have the privilege of introducing Brigadier General Roger Turner, who's just back from Afghanistan, where he's been working to restore U.S. presence and restore U.S. mentorship in the Helmand province, one of the crucial provinces of the country in the battles of the last 17 years. So we're going to hear from General Turner with his initial presentation. He's got some slides which will be nice for situational awareness and for repositioning us inside that Afghan space, understanding the geography and the military topography of Helmand province. He'll talk through a little bit of what's been happening there over the last year. Then he and I will get together for a conversation on stage before we invite your questions, and we'll do all that in 60 minutes. Uh, just a couple of brief words, therefore, about General Turner, uh, whom we're thrilled to have. We've been exchanging stories about all the different times he's worked for the generals Kelly, Mattis, and Allen, who continue to be prominent uh, across town and at Brookings, uh, and we're thrilled to have uh, such an important Marine general, and watch out for where he may be headed, uh, given where the pedigree has been going of late. Uh, but, uh, but where he's headed in the short term Mr. California to help train Marines, uh, which I know is near and dear to his heart. He uh, has been in the Marine Corps since 1984 through the ROTC program and going to the University of Maryland, an infantry officer. Uh, he's a very young man by my standards, but he's old enough to have been through almost all the big missions of the last 20 some years, starting with Operation Desert Storm. Uh, quite active throughout the broader Pacific region, as most Marines are at one point or another in their careers in the 1990s. And then for the 10-year period of sort of Operation Iraqi Freedom through uh, the early 2010s. He spent roughly half that time, by my calculations, in either Iraq or Afghanistan. He then came back to the United States for a while, but as I say, spent uh, over a year in Helmand province as a mentor uh, and the lead American advisor to the Afghan military in Helmand <laughs> province. So without further ado, please join me in giving a big Brookings welcome to General Roger Turner. Well, uh, good morning, and uh, Michael, thank you for the gracious introduction, and really just like to thank the whole Brookings team for, you know, really, really just being welcoming host to us this morning. So uh, I, I, want, I would like just to, to take a second just to introduce a couple of members of my team that are important, and you may have some questions for them. First, uh, Nazir Ahmed here. Uh, Nazir was our cultural advisor, and he's got about seven or eight years in the Helmand province, and just obviously recently returned. So if, you, if you're if you writing about Hellman or researching about Hellman and you're not talking in his ear, you're missing a golden uh, primary source. And so I would uh, offer that. And then Captain uh, Hill Hamrick, who was uh, aide de camp, but also is an intelligence officer and was key to uh, the, the team between these two uh, and our ability to interface with the Afghan leaders and kind of connect to the lead elements and the like, uh, really greatly uh, increased our effectiveness, and uh, so I'm, I'm indebted to those two individuals. The rest of the team has now been uh, has been disestablished and has moved back to other things. As uh, we were take uh, we were relieved by another Marine task force, so Task Force Southwest, which we uh, were part of, uh, still still exist, and uh, they're about uh, 60 or 70 days in, and and uh, and the good part of that is uh, they've been able to maintain or even increase some of the, the successes that we saw. So, uh, and, and I'll make comments with, with that in mind because uh, certainly uh, our contribution was not unique and it's been sustained based on Brigadier General Watson who is now uh, the commander there. Okay, so um, what, what I hope to do today is, is, uh, is to kind of maybe ramp down a level. There's obviously a lot of discussion about the South Asia strategy. There's been lots of uh, discussion as late as the secretary and the chairman and General Nicholson have been kind of talking about kind of where we are uh, six months into the South Asia strategy and, you know, and about a year into uh, the, the, some of the changes that have been made in Afghanistan and, and really kind of where we are with that. So what I'm going to try to do is bring it down a level 
to uh, to talk at, at kind of the tactical level and how how tactical success in Helmand uh, connects to operational objective for both the alliance and for the United States uh, in particular. And so so we'll um, you know we'll kind of touch on that. But uh, there's also a lot of discussion about kind of partnered operations and by with and through is kind of the is kind of the popular vernacular. So, you know, by, by a partner, with a partner, through a partner. And, and, but, uh, but, but part, of the, uh, part of the piece on that is nobody knows, like, hey, what's under the hood of that, right? What's, uh, what's the method of that? What's, how do you do that? How do you actually create uh, capability by, with, and through a partner? So I'll, t I'll spend a little bit of time on that because I think it's important. Uh, and now, like, strategically, as we, as we face a possibility now, uh, of great power war, great power competition, and then we also have important regional actors that uh, that are serious threats to us. And then, but the violent extremist problem is not going away. And uh, so, how can we address violent extremists and and groups that are going to take advantage of these ungoverned spaces? How do we how do we do that uh, in a way that's sustainable for the military and also sustainable for the economy? And then be able to uh, to tackle the violent extremist problem, but then still have the capability to go after regional actors if necessary, or compete at the uh, strategic level if necessary. So, I'll just kind of ask that as foreshadowing, and we get through it. There may be some things that you want to bring up at the question and answer period. Okay, and I will also caveat that uh, that really my experience has only been in Helmand, in Afghanistan. So I served there. Uh, as a colonel, as a regimental commander, 2011 and 2012, and then again just now. Uh, so I really can't speak at all about what's going on in Kandahar, what's going on in Kabul, you know, the effects of the National Unity Government, except for where it connects to Helmand and, and really that piece. So um, I can't really, you know, I can't speak of the, of the country a, as a whole. So that, that'll, uh, that'll be important as we kind of get into the Q&A and the like. Okay, so I, I think what... Um, the bottom line up front really is that uh, that that we're we're seeing great success in in Helmand over the last year. So we deployed last April, and uh, and and got into the uh, situation there. And and over the course of time, we were able to effectively enable our partner to steal the initiative from the Taliban. And and really, uh, once that initiative initiative was taken. Our Afghan partners were keen to maintain it, and they've maintained pretty incredible tempo against the enemy. And I'll show you some of the results of that. And they have, uh, they, with our help, have have really put the Taliban on the back foot, uh, which uh, is uh, is really really uh, critical. So, all right. So let me uh, let me kind of get into it. Just I want to just touch. If I hit, hit, uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, I just I just need to. Uh, spend just a, a minute on orientation, so I'll I'll do that briefly. So, the area in red lined out is was our area of operations. So Helmand Province on the right side of that, the Nimrud Province on the left, and you know that's about uh, two or three hundred miles from Kandahar. I'm sorry, from uh, from Kabul, and about sixty or seventy miles from from uh, from Kandahar, and uh, bordered by Iran on the west, Pakistan in the south, and then. And then uh, kind of connecting in to, to the uh, to the mountainous areas. The next slide really shows you the Helmand province, uh, not the whole thing, but really the key areas. So uh, Helmand and Nimrus are different than than the rest of the country. So uh, you know most people conjure mountainous and things like that when they think about Afghanistan and snow and things like that. It's it's not that. It's very flat, uh, very very dry desert, with the exception of the of the green areas, which is really the the prominent feature in the lifeblood of, of the area is the Helmand, the Helmand River. So running north to south, starting up in Kajaki, coming down through Garash Kalashkarga, down through Nawa and Gamsir, and then it hooks and it goes in, and that water ends up in Iran, which is obviously key to some of the agreements that the government of Afghanistan has with Iran on the water rights and that sort of thing. Uh, most of you are also aware about the U.S. aid project that uh, that greatly expanded the arable terrain. In the Helmand province, it was built in the 50s and 60s. So the Kajaki Dam and then the canal project, so it probably uh, quadrupled the size. I mean, the, the Helmand River would have just gone, been a little sliver of uh, irrigation through the province and would have been just basically flood irrigated uh, by locals and the like. But the, the U.S. aid 
the USAID project that was built and still it still works and it still maintains uh, uh, really greatly enhanced the amount of arable land in, in the province so and that and that became important and so that's kind of um, you know that that's one of the reasons and then, and then the, the population in Helmand uh, obviously the Lashkar Ga is the capital uh, Goreshk is also the ma other major urban area but uh, we'll talk more about Central Helmand. Central Helmand is the most important to the government of Afghanistan, and that, that we'll talk a lot about that because that was absolutely our focus area, right? Uh, Lashkar Ga, Natali, uh, Goreshk, Marja Nawa, uh, uh, really, that was really our, our focus because that's the most important piece. That's where most of the population lives. Uh, that's where the universities are, the hospitals are, the airports, the roads, and things like that. So that's the, uh, that's the most important bit. Uh, Next, I think it's important we just just kind of a brief uh, piece on, on the history here and, and why Helmand is important and kind of what the history of our involvement has been there. And, and again, I won't go through a lot of it, but, but you know, they, uh, Helmand is important because uh, Helmand and Kandahar are really, that's where the Taliban get their start. So just uh, just a little bit to the east of Lashkar Gah, as you move, move towards Maywan and like that's, that was the, the, where the Taliban was founded, and and that's uh, that really became their, uh, you know, their their home. And a lot of the a lot of the Taliban leadership leadership even today are are Helmandis, and and so Helmand is is a is a power base for for the Taliban. Uh, also, the, the 9/11 attacks were 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 trained and ordered from uh, Helmand and Kandahar. So this is where the 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 post the pre 9/11 uh, conditions that gave us 9/11 uh, attacks and, and alike. It, it came. It emanates right, right from, right from here as well. Um, the history of the of our military involvement there has has been significant, and, and I won't go through the whole thing. But, but between 2010 and 2014, there was about uh, 30,000 coalition forces in Helmand Province. So, about 20,000 Marines and about 10,000 uh, Brits as part of the part of the uh, uh, ISAF mission. And you know we enjoyed great success in Helmand during those years, and uh, and and so that's kind of where we we set at that point. Uh, but as you all know well, the previous strategy was a time-based strategy rather than a conditions-based strategy. So that basically had all coalition forces were removed from the Helmand province in in 2014, uh, and that was based on obviously the based on the numbers of forces that that were gonna be uh, allowed to stay in Afghanistan. And then uh, because of the location here, uh, it was unsupportable to, uh, to keep uh, coalition forces in Helmand. And so that, that pulled back. And then what happens then is a, is a fairly rapid deterioration of, uh, of the forces, which then leads to our, 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 our going back last, uh, last April. So uh, we, showed up at, we showed up there last April and, and we really found that our Afghan partners were, were completely on the defensive and really demoralized. They had kind of suffered defeat after defeat. They didn't feel like they were being supported by the government or, or anybody else. And then, uh, and so they, they were in great difficulty. But what we did have that was important was the, uh, the Afghan government had inserted some new leadership. So a new corps commander, uh, a new governor, provincial governor, and also a new zone commander. And the zone is like the MOI forces, the Minister of Interior forces that are there. And then coupled with our capability. So we come in with a purpose-built force that was built from the ground up to train, advise, and assist uh, our Afghan partners to, ex to help the Afghan government expand population control and also pressurize the Taliban. So what unfolds over the next year is that... Uh, the Afghan leaders that we worked with, they were unwilling to accept the status quo, which, which was really, they were really just fortressed up around Lashkar Gah and Goreshk, uh, totally on the defensive, and the Taliban pretty much had the rest of the province, most of the green areas uh, that, that, you, that you see up there. Uh, airports were closed down, the roads were mostly impassable, uh, so the situation was, was, really, was really bad. Uh, but the Afghan leaders that we're working with, they weren't willing to accept that, and they wanted to do to do better. And then once we coupled with our ability to effectively enable them, they really stole the initiative from the Taliban starting in in about May of last year. And then once 
once they stole the initiative, they maintained it. And we were able to kind of convince them and they realized that they were, you know, it's by, by holding the initiative and by, by using tempo as a weapon, they could outpace and outcycle the Taliban and they were, they were much more successful and they took far less casualties uh, employing their forces that way as opposed to letting the Taliban pick the time and place of an attack. So the other thing that's important here is that the Taliban in 2017, I think some of you may have seen it, they came out publicly, they called it Operation Mansouri, and it was essentially their operational plan for last year. Uh, in that, they said, we're going to take the rest of the Helmand province and we're going to take Lashkar Gah and Goresh, and we're going to make Lashkar Gah the capital of the caliphate in Afghanistan. So that's their stated goals, and they come out with that very publicly in May. And, and, uh, but what we find instead is that they're losing terrain and, and uh, they're, they're ineffective. In, you know, so they're not only achieving their goals, they're losing terrain really critical to that, which was, uh, which was a great blow to them. And we'll talk more uh, about that as well. Okay, um, I went the wrong way. All right, really, really four, four key lessons. That, uh, that we learned during our, our time there. So I'll talk about these briefly and we can talk more about them in, uh, in the question and answer. But, but Afghan forces, and when we say Afghan forces, we, we're talking about not just the army, but the police as well. Uh, if they're properly enabled, and I put that in bold because that's, that's really critical, properly enabled, can and will defeat the Taliban at the point of attack. Uh, we found that over and over again and, and they, uh, they demonstrated that capability, so properly enabled. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about what that looks like. The, uh, for us, the Afghan center of gravity is their confidence and their willingness to conduct offensive operations. So we viewed, we viewed their confidence. So it, at first it was very low, and they, were, uh, they didn't think they could win, and they didn't think they were, um, that, that they had the capability to beat the Taliban. Uh, as they started to do it, and as they became more effective, they became increasingly bold and increasingly ambitious, and and that that you know it had basically a synergistic effect on on the problem set for us. So, but but we viewed their confidence as the most important thing. So it wasn't necessarily their capability or how much combat power they could bring. It was the confidence that was the most important thing. And then advising activity, the way the way I view it, it's really it's really a non kinetic effect. So U.S. advisors or coalition advisors, when they're with a partnered force, they change the dynamic. Uh, so it, it changes the environment, and it, you know, we have to recognize kind of that piece. But then if, if you talk about advising activity, there's really three big buckets that people, uh, people will talk about. So advisors can enhance, enhance a partner's warfighting capability. You can build the partner's capacity, and you can generate forces. So those are typically the three big buckets of advising activity. And this is not only for the Afghan problem set. This is like or any place that we're conducting advising activity. Far and away, we prioritize the ability to enhance the partner's warfighting capability is the most important thing. So that's like their intelligence capability, their maneuver capability, their logistics capability, their command and control capability. Uh, our ability to make that better was the most important advising activity we did. And then last, is accompanying Afghan forces on missions can reverse the mo reverse momentum of the campaign and actually create a dependency on U.S. forces. We, we found our Afghan partners quite willing to go forward and fight for their country, and they didn't need nor want uh, Americans by their side. Uh, they were quite willing to do it, if properly enabled, so, and if confident, right? So it, it was kind of a, a piece we had to kind of step into. It. So we built their confidence by demonstrating capability, as they became more confident, they became increasingly ambitious. As they became more ambitious, they opened the Taliban up to additional, uh, additional targeting from us and from Afghan forces. So the, the whole thing kind of comes together. So I would ask you as you kind of like think through this problem, uh, don't be a reductionist and try to say, well, it's all about the fires or all about the authorities or it's all about the rules of engagement or it's all about the capability. It's kind of, it's not that, it's all of it, right? Is it all kind of comes together. So. Um, Okay, and uh, oh, the wrong way again. Sorry. Okay, so I talked, and I'll just, I'll just touch on this briefly. This is this map represents Central Helmand, so you can see Lashkar Gah up in the center, not a league, Goresh, uh, the Shorab off to the uh, off to the west. Where, that's where we were located. 
So this is, uh, again, this is the most important bit. So if you ask uh, the Afghan governor or you ask the Corps commander or you ask the MOI commanders that are there, Central Helmand is our focus because of all the reasons that I talked about before. Um, the, the dotted line up there kind of represents what's the line of control of the Afghan forces right now. Um, since we left, uh, our, our replacements and, and the, the Afghan leaders that are still there have actually expanded this a little bit beyond where it is now. And, uh, but this is kind of where uh, the Afghan government controls. And, and uh, when we got there, the, the Taliban were very much trying to hold terrain and they were very much trying to govern, which was different than our previous experience. Uh, since, since we've left it, they've, they have morphed a little bit because they're realizing that they don't really have the ability to govern and hold terrain uh, against the capability that the Afghan forces now have. So that's kind of, um, that's what that looks like. What, what's probably important again is uh, if you look on the southern part, so from Lashkar Gah to the south, you'll see the Nawa district. Some of you guys are probably familiar with, uh, with Nawa. It's a very important district, very, very uh, traditional uh, Afghan tribally, very, it's very homogeneous tribally, and has traditionally supported the government. And the Taliban held, held the Dawa district uh, for about a, a year and a half, I believe. And uh, early in the campaign, we were able to, uh, working with our Afghan partners, to take back the Nawa district. And some of those pictures that are, I know are hard to, probably hard to see uh, show the Afghans taking down the Taliban flags and raising the, the, uh, the Afghan flags on that district. And it's a very large district, it's very important. It also uh, was key to facilitating the, uh, some of the roads and the airports and things like that reopening. Uh, but, but really, it, it became, in kind of marine parlance, it, it really became kind of a Guadalcanal moment. Similar to the way the Guadalcanal was the first victory in the Pacific in World War II, uh, the Nawa district uh, you know, represented an Afghan success in 2017 in the face of, of Op Mansouri when the Taliban had, had said that we're going to take Lashkar Gah. We're going to take the rest of Helmand Province, and we're going to make Lashkar Gah the capital of the caliphate. But then they're losing the Nawa district right in the face of that. So it was very important, uh, but very important uh, tangibly and also uh, information. The information effect that it had on the enemy was really was really critical as well. All right. Um, so this this is just kind of as, as I discussed earlier. Like okay, so by with and through partnered operations, you hear a lot of talk about that. What does it, you know, what does it look like? And what's under the hood? How do you do it? And uh, so first and foremost, it, it, the, our approach was we, uh, it was Afghan led. So we, we didn't, we never imposed our objectives on any of these missions. It was the Afghans saying, we want to go here. We want to go to Natali and we want to do it on this date. And then they would kind of all line up on that. And then the advisors and our Afghan partners would all work together to develop a plan that was going to be executable and and have uh, and have the uh, effect that that we uh, we wanted, and and from my perspective, if the Afghans were achieving an objective that they wanted, as long as it achieved my objectives as well, then we we completely supported it. So, uh, it everything worked really well on that. So so there would be a couple of weeks usually that would take place to kind of get one of these operations together. And then on game day, it would look something like this, what's on the slide. So on the bottom left there is kind of represents an Afghan maneuver element uh, that we had uh, that would be out there. And this would typically be uh, Afghan army, Afghan police, uh, Afghan intelligence uh, you know, forces that would be maneuvering. And then uh, our advisors would be plugged in at all as many Afghan command nodes as we could get on. And uh, that's key to like the capacity of the force. So, and, and some of that, I know you, you are aware that some of the forces are increasing there. The more places you can touch and the more command and control nodes that you can uh, put uh, advisors at, then the greater, the greater ability you have to sense what your partner's capabilities are and, and kind of react to. So we, we would plug our advisors in to that. And then obviously that's plugged into our joint operations center that's on the, uh, on the top. And then out in front there, we would be using a mix of uh, Afghan intelligence gathering capabilities and American uh, Af intelligence gathering capabilities. But we would, blend, we would blend their intelligence capabilities with ours and they'd be very much, uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't like that we had uh, the most information and it was about trying to share it with them. It was a lot of times it was the other way around. They knew far more than we did. 
we just had to kind of leverage that and use our assets within our capabilities. Uh, and then we had a number of fires assets that, that uh, we would bring to bear. We also had Afghan capabilities, so uh, they have the MD-530 aircraft, they have A-29s. We would integrate them into the fight. We would try to pursue Afghan solutions uh, first, and we saw those increase over time. And then we had a number of American uh, fire support assets, in this case, uh, A-64s, F-16s, B-52s, and, and alike. And that's where, that's where the authorities and that's where the uh, capabilities are important. Uh, for us to, to be able to do it. But with this methodology here, we were able to create an overmatch that the Afghan government forces could beat the Taliban with this system any, any day of the week. And they did it over and over again. And like I talked about tempo, so I think uh, we were there about 280 days. I think about 250 days they conducted an operation that looked something like this, uh, often in multiple places in the province simultaneously. So we were obviously uh, often very challenged just to try to support our partners because as they became increasingly confident and increasingly ambitious, uh, their tempo was impressive and it was difficult for us even to keep up. So, so that's the, uh, and again, that's under the hood and we can talk more about this if you have, if you have additional questions. But, uh, so I, I think uh, that, that's really what I wanted to offer as far as opening comments. But, uh, but I, I think it's, it's important that the South Asia strategy that uh, was announced last August. Uh, this, is, this is some of the effects that we're seeing. Uh, our partners now are reassured that our presence is not time-based, it's conditions-based. Uh, that has an effect on our partner and has an effect on the enemy. And I think we're starting to see uh, the leading edge here that the Taliban now realize that uh, in the face of, uh, of, a, of an Afghan-enabled uh, force that's effectively enabled, uh, they're not going to be able to achieve the objectives that they have enunciated in the past. So, uh, anyway, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's uh, encouraging to see, and, and I think we all got a lot out of that. Let me just follow up with a couple of specifics, if I could. Sure. I know that General or Secretary Mattis has decided not to share as much information about how many districts are held by the government and how many by the enemy. I have my qualms about holding back that data because it makes it harder for the rest of us to assess the campaign. So can you perhaps at least help us a little bit more quantitatively with Hellman? You, you mentioned a number of specific places where things had improved. Is there any number in your head about what percent of the populated areas of Helmand is now back in government control. I mean, how far are we towards getting to the objective that's that's desired? Yeah, I, I don't I don't have a specific number in mind. I, I I'd almost think it's because you know, Michael, you get into this thing about okay, if if the government controls the district center, but some areas of the district are still being contested, is it in or not? I mean, is it is it under control or not? So that it it gets to be very difficult to define. But I I would say this. Uh, the effect that we were able to achieve in Central Helmand in particular, uh, now, like if you live in Lashkar Gah now, you, you, are, you are confident that you can get back and forth to Kandahar without being attacked. If you want to take a flight to Kabul, the airport is, is open and you can, you can fly back. Uh, you know, the city is, is somewhat peaceful. Obviously, there's still, you know, attacks that, that, do, that do take place. Uh, so Lashkar Gah, Goresh, uh, you know, things, things are functioning down the province. Last, this time last year, they were not. The roads were uh, impassable. The airport was closed. Uh, so, so I think, you know, we were able to achieve some good effects. Uh, but there's still there's still clearly you know work to be would be done. Uh, our belief is that that about 60 percent of the population of Helmand lives in that central Helmand bit, and I, I believe it's well within the Afghan capability and capacity to secure that, in the face of the current threat and if the threat goes down, then they'll have even more capability. So again, I don't want to push this point too far, but just notionally speaking, because you talked about how bad things were in Helmand before you arrived, at that point, clearly, from what I'm hearing you say, probably less than a quarter of the population lived in a way that was relatively safe from Taliban interference or control. And today, maybe, maybe it's closer to 50%. Is that a, are those rough numbers wrong? Yeah, that, I mean, I think that's probably, that's probably close, a 50% number. But again, it's hard. It's hard to quantify, right? Because uh, 
like if you're in central Goresh right now, things are very good. You know, as you as you drift out of there into the countryside, there may be a point where, you know, you're, you would be in danger. So it's hard to understand uh, exactly how that, that would look, right? And you did all this with, I mean, as you said, the Afghans did most of it. You helped them. But you did all of this with about 300 Marines in province. Is that the right number? And that's going up to maybe 500? Yeah, so we had 300, and that, those numbers crept up a little bit um, during our time there. And then the current, the current force that's there now has, uh, has more. So what, what it allows him to do that I couldn't do is he can actually, he can persist at lower levels, whereas I could go down there episodically for like an operation, and then I had to pull my people back in order to do other tasks. Uh, he, he now has the ability to kind of project it to lower levels, so it's helpful. So to just break that down without asking you to say anything more than you can say in an open forum, out of several hundred Marines in Hellman, roughly how many different teams and how many different locations? I mean, and if you need to be general, I understand, but or qualitative more than quantitative. Yeah, so I, I would say that he's, he's got the ability now, the General Watson, to, uh, to persist at, at uh, at least two or three additional locations that I couldn't. And, uh, and then that gives them the capability to make progress faster. So what, uh, what, what advising activities, like I said in the brief, it, it's, a non uh, uh, it's a non-kinetic activity that allows us, it changes the environment when they're there. So when advisors can plug in and persist at a certain level, you can make progress faster. And so that, that was where uh, I had to do it episodically. He can do it persistently. And you were at several locations yourself already. Yes. So he's at two or three more above that. You showed a lot of American air power and also some American artillery. Yeah. And, but you mentioned that the Afghan Air Force is being built with the A-29 aircraft and others. If you had to project, I'm not, I'm not sure there's a specific goal in mind, but uh, can you give us a feel for over, let's say, the next two to three years, if we keep on at this mission the way it's being done now, uh, what additional fraction of the air power can be provided by the Afghans themselves? Yeah, we, we, we saw good success with it. So the, um, <clears throat> they were most... Uh, most capable, the MD-530, which is an attack helicopter. And they had those uh, resident inside the core, and then they could bring those to bear. And uh, so they had rockets and machine guns, and they were able to support their maneuver forces with that. Um, and then they also used the A-29 uh, to do that. And we were able, we were effective kind of working with them to getting them to do what we would consider to be like a, like a frontline Afghan controller that would actually be directing aircraft uh, from a front you know, in support of their maneuver. And, and so that, that was a fact. So I, I think uh, we saw it grow over time. Uh, it's, it's, still, it's still a difficult task, as you can imagine, as they're trying to grow uh, air crews and maintainers and then also grow special skills uh, all, all simultaneously. So I, I think, you know, the, the work that the Air Force uh, – the work that's being done to increase the Air Force is important work, and we're seeing them, we're seeing them to be more and more effective, but it, it is difficult. The, the degree of specialization and maintainers and things like that, I mean, those are hard, those are hard, I mean, sometimes those are hard capabilities for us to maintain, right? We're challenged with, with even in the, in the American military to try to maintain those high skill sets and, and compete with, you know, private industry and things like that. So they, they face that as well as they're trying to grow these capabilities from scratch. Now, you mentioned that, um, that you know, it, it's going to take a while to make this kind of headway, and we need to recognize there's an importance to just saying we're there for the long haul. And one of the dilemmas we've had before is maybe pulling back a little too quickly and being too calendar-based. Other people, though, have also emphasized that part of the problem with working with the Afghan security forces is the amount of turnover and attrition. And so to what extent is your successor and then his successor and so on going to sort of have to keep reinventing the wheel or to what extent do you think we can actually make durable progress that we can just keep building on incrementally from one command and one year to another? Right, right. Well, I think, I think it starts with the strategy first. So the, the enduring nature of the strategy is really important. It's really important to our partners that they know that we're going to be with them. And, uh, and then uh, it, it's just like I was saying about kind of the – the aspect of winning, uh, it, winning for the Afghans, it has positive impacts in other areas too, right? So when they're winning and, they're, and they think they're being successful, all of a sudden their attrition rates start to go down. Take, they took like 40% uh, less casualties uh, in 2017 than they took the previous year. So less casualties, higher morale, uh, 
you know, and then then all and so and then now you know you don't have as much uh, challenge to to get your highly skilled people inside the uh, inside the forces because they're it's you know the the problem is not as difficult, right? So, so it's like winning but gets win winning, and and so we saw a lot of that, and uh, but but there is still hard work to be done. Force generation, like I like I mentioned, is a key aspect. We prioritize warfighting function enhancement uh, to give us offensive capability, but. The tasks that we do on force generation are really important as well, and and so that's an important component of the mission that, uh, that that's being worked on all over Afghanistan as well. Let me ask two more questions: one about Pakistan, and then one um, recognizing that you don't want to talk about the nationwide picture too much. I just still need to link this discussion to the broader question of the trajectory of the war. But you were bordering Pakistan, and we know that historically, a lot of the uh, leaders of the Taliban have been based in Pakistan. That's been part of the problem. We haven't been able to get at them the way we'd like. And they can continue to try to recruit and motivate foot soldiers. I know some of the Taliban leadership in Helmand is probably in Helmand. Some of it may be in Spinboldak or in uh, Quetta Shura over in Pakistan. I wondered if you would, I guess the way to put the question to a point, have you seen any change in Pakistani cooperation or behavior or helpfulness in the months since President Trump has like his predecessor, like many American commanders and ambassadors, asked the Pakistanis to help us more and stop playing as much of a double game as they historically have been doing. Hmm. Yeah, the, what, what I think, uh, the way I would try to answer that is the Taliban and Hellman couldn't exist without external support. And they get that external support from a number of the regional, regional actors. A number of the regional actors have interest there, and and certainly uh, have malign influence in the province. And then the second big component of, of Helmand is the the poppy and the opium that's grown there also provides a lot of financing to uh, to the Taliban. So really, the confluence of external support and the poppy production give uh, the Taliban a, a pretty consistent source of uh, income that allow them to uh, to have men, weapons, and material to be able to kind of continue the fight. So. So I think the, the components of our strategy to pressurize the, ex, the regional players to, to uh, cease support for the Taliban is, uh, is a really important component. Because I, I believe that if, if the Afghans only had to deal with the Taliban, they could deal with it. Uh, but the Taliban being enabled by regional uh, actors uh, creates them, creates, that's probably the reason we need to be involved in supporting them still. So whatever help Pakistan may be providing, we could still use a lot more. Is that a fair yeah. <laughs> summary? Uh, now, President Ghani has been remarkable in some of his big ideas in recent months. He's a big thinker. We all know that. And one of them has to do with a new peace overture towards the Taliban. And one of them has to do with the military campaign. And I want to ask you about the second. And then we'll bring in others and who may want to bring it, you know, the rest of the topics back to discussion as well. I'll leave the Taliban uh, reconciliation efforts for later and for others to bring up. But I wanted to ask about this goal of President Ghani that ideally within two or three years, 80 percent of the country or its population would be back under the control of the government. Current estimates, current unclassified U.S. estimates, of course, are that less than 60 percent of the government, uh, of the population and territory are controlled by the government, roughly in the high 50s to 60 percent. Mm -hmm. That's down from maybe 70 percent when General Allen, General Dunford were in command and we had a much larger U.S. military footprint. Uh, it was never 80 percent, I don't think, even in the days of the surge. So how realistic is it and how necessary is it to get to that 80 percent nationwide goal, recognizing that you only want to speak primarily from your own experience in Hellman? But to what extent do you think that 80 percent goal is realistic? Yeah, no, I, I think the 80 percent number is important and I think we should drive towards that. I, I think that's that that's uh, that's a good goal that obviously the president Ghana has articulated and we're and we're supporting him as part of his four year plan, uh, campaign plan. Uh, but I also think it's important that we don't do anything that the Afghans don't have the capability to sustain. And I think some of the lessons from the from the surge is that you know that forces that uh, that push the Taliban out of areas that then the Afghans didn't have the capability to sustain uh, that 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 was very unhelpful for them 
as we as we withdrew our, our forces. So I think what we just need to consider is so that those are good goals, but kind of consider the confluence between threat and Afghan capability, and and kind of how that how the, you know the interrelate the interrelationship between those things. So let's uh, what can they do? What's sustainable? What's supportable? Uh, rather than like letting the number like you know drive us because if we just go after 80% of the population but then they don't have the capability to hold it then then it would be unhelpful right so so I, I really think it's kind of that, that where is the intersection between uh, threat if we can buy down the Taliban threat either through uh, through military effects or reconciliation increase the Afghan capabilities which is what kind of what's part of the, the campaign and then and then set set the goal there right and i and i think that's what we just need to be very uh very clear-eyed about that we don't uh, we don't do something that they can't sustain fantastic well thank you excellent answers a lot of information and i'm sure others want to get into this too so please wait for a microphone and then identify yourself and we'll take a couple of questions at a time if that's all right so we'll start up here in the front two rows the two gentlemen over here on the far side take those together please Thanks, General Turner, for doing this. Uh, I'm Wes Morgan with Politico. Hi, everybody. Just a quick reminder, Mox News survives solely on your tips and contributions. It's easy to make a contribution or a tip or leave a tip at moxnews.com, or there are clickable links in the text body of this video. It should take the average person, most people, probably less than two minutes. Thanks very much for your time and your continued support. Stay cool, Wednesday. This war is going to end. Till that day. Thanks, General Turner, for doing this. Uh, I'm Wes Morgan with Politico. Um, starting last November or so, we started hearing a lot from Resolute Support and General Nicholson um, about the new strikes using new authorities on the opium processing facilities. And, you know, it's something that Resolute Support made a big deal out of. Um, you mentioned two things that make me wonder about that. One, kind of not focusing on authorities um, as the kind of the, the new thing. Uh, and then also not doing things that the Afghans can't sustain. Um, so I was just wondering, um, based on this deployment and also your previous deployment to Helmand, um, what was what's your perspective on the importance of these uh, counter counter opium processing efforts? I know they're not being described as counter narcotics efforts. Um, and also, you know, what were your what did your partners make of it in the 215th Corps? What did they think was the importance of these new efforts? Maybe it's easier to let you answer that one directly. And then yeah, yeah. Good. No, we'll go to Otto next. Uh, good. Thank you. Thank you for that that question. We're Th those are important efforts. So the, uh, the, uh, the, the authorities that we received allowed us to target Taliban financing that we're, and really what was important is where we could uh, see that there was a clear connection between opium production and Taliban. And so uh, it's actually not hard to do that in Helmand because uh, the Helmand, most of the Helmand-based Taliban are completely connected to the opium trade. And... Uh, and that's really where they derive a lot of their, their support from. But uh, it, anyway, it's an important component. Uh, but what was, what was important about it was the combined effect. So Afghan maneuver, like the operations we were supporting with, you know, uh, Afghan maneuver to seize terrain from the Taliban that was being supported, and in, 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 uh, that, that was one component. Special operations forces doing targeting as well. So uh, both uh, Afghan independent operations and partnered operation with U.S. Special Forces was another component. And then you put the, uh, you put the counter narcotic strikes uh, on top of that. So, right, the three of those things together what created, created a pretty significant effect on the Taliban. And I think that's changed their uh, – our partners were, uh, were quite keen to, uh, to do it. They thought it was very important. And we, we, we had solid support from President Ghani and also Governor Hayat, who is the, uh, the governor in the, in the province. And then the Afghans even participated in this to kind of speak to your uh, question about sustainability. The Afghan Air Force uh, participated in these, these, uh, these strikes as well. Morning, General Otto Kreischer, Sea Power Magazine. You know, the Army has created this uh, advise and assist brigades that they're sending uh, into Afghanistan and, and Iraq. What, what was the force that you had took with you? Were they selectively were picked selectively? And what kind of training did you get there, uh, so that you weren't sending just you know, conventional uh, uh, grunts into the, into that, that situation? Sure. And, and your rank level. I, I assume you had more senior uh, personnel than you normally would in, a, in, a, in an infantry company. Right. No, thanks for that. The um, so. 
We did not have a specialized force, so we uh, we we had a a three hundred you know we had three hundred man force. Um, about half of that force was advisors, and about half of it was not. So uh, so the the half of it that wasn't is essentially additional capability, and that's quite those are conventional outfits that that uh, that you would be familiar with, like a rifle company and artillery and things like that. Just to clarify, all your F-16s and so forth, they're coming from either Kandahar or further away, so they're not part of your 300. That's right. Yeah. They, uh, but the advising effort, so we, we drew, we drew uh, officers and staff, non-commissioned officers from across. And the whole force came out of 2MEF at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. They all came out of there, and they were all, uh, uh, you know, it, kind of MOS qualified Marines. Some of them had previous advising experience, but, but a lot didn't. And, uh, and so I... Honestly, I, I, the Marine Corps is the Marine Corps is building a, an advisor uh, group, and, and we, we do have we are heading that direction. But uh, but we took we took Marines and sailors who were uh, essentially out of the conventional force, and 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 then did some training to to bring them up to to be able to conduct this. Uh, I I actually think that uh, in some cases we make way too much of this. That a lot of the capability is, you, you know, you need to be, like, if you're going to be an intelligence advisor, you need to be a really good intelligence officer or staff and CO. You need to know, to know your trade. You need to know, like, the, the processes that we use and all that kind of stuff. And then a lot of the interactions that you have with your partners are relatively common sense engagements, right? I mean, the Afghans, uh, you know, we, we, we easily strike common cause with our partners and, and, and build rapport and things like that. So a lot of the soft skills that I think people, you know, talk about a lot about advising, I, I quite honestly, I think we make way too much of it. And uh, that a lot of this is inherent in the force and it doesn't require a great deal of specialization. And, and that, that Marines and sailors and soldiers that we worked with in Afghanistan, they, uh, they took this, took to this easily and, and really performed well and, uh, and produced some amazing effects. Language, language assistance, you have up interpreters? Yes. Increased level of interpreters, so you do the language? Uh, sure, yeah, the, 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 most of the interpreters are, translators are, they're, they're run under a contract. So it's a mix of uh, Afghan local hires and then also uh, some of the higher end are, are fully, you know, U.S. citizens fully, uh, you know, fully uh, cleared for, you know, high level uh, classifications and things like that. So that's mostly a contract piece. And, and I think, you know, one of the dilemmas, right, if you're going to try to build a force with multiple language capabilities, that's a really difficult thing for us to do, right? Because... Uh, you know, in the Helmand province, uh, even the Afghan army speaks mostly Pashto because that's what the locals speak. And then and if you go to if you go to Kabul, they're speaking mostly Dari and things like that. Right. And and, uh, and so the uh, to, to build a language capability inside the conventional force, that's going to allow this is be a very difficult thing for us to do. But by the way, are you seeing more ability to recruit from the Pashto locals than we were able to achieve five, eight years ago? It, it's it's consistent on the police side. Uh, but they're still they're still challenged on the uh, on the Afghan army, and so so really you know the forces that we we employed were mostly um, Minister of Interior forces that were mostly Helmandis, and and then the uh, Afghan army is mostly uh, mostly from around the Kabul cluster, some from Kandahar and the like, uh, but the combined forces that come together was what was powerful. So often the police were very aggressive at the point of attack. Uh, knew the area, knew the locals really well, but but then they wouldn't go unless the Afghan army was going to go with them to provide them the firepower and the muscle, right? So it was kind of the combined effect where we saw our most success. Great. See, we go to my friend in the back uh, about the tenth row. A couple rows up. Yep. Hi, General. Thanks for the presentation, Doug Brooks from the Afghan American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, two quick questions. One: um, Are the Afghans able to get their goods to? to Kabul or to the markets uh, on using the roads? Is that all opened up in Helmand province? And second of all, where are the Taliban getting their weapons from? You must have been able to track where they've been uh, produced, how old they are, where's the ammunition coming from? Um, this, we must have some information on this, but I've not seen anything on it. Uh, thanks for that. I, uh, the roads are obviously important. 
uh, for people to be able to to move good, you know goods and services. So, so the ring road that that goes between Kandahar, between uh, Goreshk, and then f- towards Points West is uh, is fully trafficable and it's like traffic nonstop on it and things like that. Uh, the other highways that would li- allow you to go from places like Nawa and uh, Lashkar Ga towards Kandahar, those are those are now open and and are not. Uh, that that are not they're not significantly challenged by by the enemy. So so the major population centers are connected for goods and services and people to move back and forth and things like that. Uh, as you move into the more rural areas and stuff like that, then that's when that's when you, there's going to be some challenges to the to those areas. Uh, as far as men, weapons and equipment, or as far as weapons that that flow to the Taliban, I. I uh, I think the most I could say would just be is I believe a lot of it comes from the regional actors. So the the neighbors uh, the neighbors of Helmand and, and Nimrus uh, provide provide equipment to the Taliban, and uh, some of that they they probably provide uh, you know willingly uh, through you know just giving it to them, and then others they probably are buying it uh, using the opium profits to uh, to use to purchase equipments. Here on, on the. Uh Right side, my right side on the fifth row, please. Hi, General. Uh, Caroline Houck with Defense One. Um, you mentioned that once the Afghan partner forces' confidence increased, their uh, desired tempo of operations almost outpaced your ability to provide support. Um, is that something that's going to be addressed as assets, particularly air assets, are transferred from Iraq, Syria, over to the Afghan fight, or is that something more to do with your forces in the area? Thanks. No, thanks. No, great question. So, uh, no, I, I expect that uh, the current campaign, the 2018 campaign, is much has much more resources than what we had in 2017. So as you know, obviously the the fight against ISIS in both Iraq and Syria was still going on uh, during the time that we were doing our operations. So there was times when we didn't have enough, and our Afghan partners, you know, kind of would get close occasionally to outpacing our ability to support them. Uh, I don't expect that that's going to be a problem in the campaign now. So the the campaign is well resourced to really allow all of the tax and task forces to kind of produce some of the capability that I was showing there. And, and I think that's going to really ratchet the pressure on the Taliban across all of Afghanistan. Go to the uh, gentleman here in, in about the seventh row. At the tie clip. Hey, sir. Harrison Lieber, um, former 7th Marine uh, Regiment. I had a question about the Afghans doing a mission on their own without coalition support and using that as a basis to judge improvement. Is that something you guys are doing? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, and, and there was plenty of times when they did that, when they did things completely, you know, completely on their own. And, uh, and like I was saying, we wouldn't superimpose ourselves on it. If they, if they were, I mean, a good example would be medical. So I, I had the authorities to provide American medical support to Afghans, but we rarely used it. And so even if they suffered like a like a mass casualty event or something like that, they, they were pretty proud of their capability to use their MI-17s to go pick up casualties, fly them back to their hospitals, and then and then conduct surgery. We would a lot of times send our doctors over there just to kind of see how they were doing and ask them again, like, hey, do you need us? We, we can bring people over to our camp and we can do surgery and things. And they're like, no, we, we're good. You know, we're uh, so they're they're pretty proud of their capabilities. And when and, and so we don't. You know, we don't force ourselves into anything, and and so you know everything that we do, we ask, like, do you want us to help here? And if they do, we we do if, if we can. And and but uh, but they're they're proud and of their ability to do things themselves. And uh, anytime they could, we we let them run for sure. Quick follow up for me on that. Noah, go oh, go ahead. Take your own follow up first. Do you think any dependencies are forming then? Like, uh, if we just wait long enough, or if we just convey a certain level of weakness the Marines will bring their F-16s. Yeah, and we, uh, that, that's part of the art of advising, right? I mean, that's kind of the art of this, is that, you know, uh, if 
if you're going to do it for them all the time, then then they'll let you, right? I mean, I, and I don't. The Afghans aren't unique in this. I think this is probably in any sort of relationship. We we have tremendous capabilities and capacities in our forces, and you know, great great weapon systems and things like that. So if we're if you if you're gonna if you're gonna absolutely do it for them, they'll let you, right? And uh, but. But the art of advising is is to kind of increase uh, that and, and kind of be wary of, okay, if, if I do this, am I building a dependency? And what is the second and third order effects of that? And so, but but again, we kind of looked at confidence as being, the like, like I said, like the center of gravity. The most important thing is their confidence. So uh, we need to do enough to make them, make them successful in this, uh, but not, you know, but not go overboard or whatever. And, and, and if they had the capability like if MD 530s were going to come support a maneuver type of thing, we would just stay out of it and let them do it. And if they achieved the success themselves, then they were even more confident, right? So, and so we wouldn't, and then we would use our assets other places and things like that. A question on Afghan casualties. One of the concerns in recent years has been the high level of Afghan fatalities in their police and their army. And the estimates have usually not been volunteered in a comprehensive way by ISAF or its successor commands, but they've been estimated in the range of 5,000 to 10,000 killed in action nationwide per year among Afghan forces. I don't want to ask you about nationwide trends, but do you see any improvement in those numbers in Helmand such that the casualties may be declining over time, one would hope, and thereby make, make it more possible to keep building up the army and police with less turnover, less loss? Sure. Yeah, we saw we saw about a 40% reduction in casualties in 2017 in the Afghan National Army that's stationed in Helmand. So the 215th Corps had about a 40% reduction in casualties. But then again, there's a, a, a big synergy piece to this too, right? So they also, their AWOL rates dropped significantly. Uh, they would send soldiers on leave and then the soldiers would come back, right? So like, you know, a lot of this is just, if a soldier knows that he's going to, he's not going to be supported and he's likely going to be left to die in, in the Helmand province, if he gets a chance to co go on leave, he's not going to come back. And so, as they became successful, now they send that they send that soldier on leave, and he actually comes back from leave and and, and uh, continues on. So, so it's not just casualties. I think it's uh, it's the AWOL rates, it's the morale factor. Some of those are you know, difficult to measure, but uh, but we, we definitely saw that increase. Excellent. We have time for one or two more questions. So let's go about the, to the right in front of you, yeah, to the sixth row here. And then we'll come up front. Sir, good morning. Thank you for your time. Uh, Carrie Gray, representing myself today. Um, leveraging uh, Harris's, Harrison's question, um, you talked about how the strategy is improving, um, their confidence is increasing. We're seeing results, and um, they're, we're often supporting their decisions. Can you talk about a time where there might have been a disagreement, uh, what that looked like, um, how it was solved, and maybe how it affected the lower level commanders? Sure. We didn't. We we weren't successful without having the Afghans kind of all agree on the objective. So it would typically be that the governor, the corps commander, the zone commander, kind of the collective group of generals and the governor all come together saying this is the objective and this is the most important thing. If that all lined up, we almost we would we would hit a home run like every time. If there was uh, if there was a difference of opinion amongst the Afghans. Then they would be like, "Well, this is really important for the army, but the police don't really agree." And, and, and in some cases, we 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 still tried to make things work like that, but we very very rarely succeeded unless there was a confluence of of direction from them. So, so the uh, so kind of what we consider the Afghan pillars, which really is the Minister of Interior, the army, and the government. When they're all together in like a triad, then then you, you know you have a very high chance of of, of achieving success and, and producing a lot of combat power. If there's disagreement there, then then uh, a very low chance of succeeding. I think we'll take one last question up here, the very front row, and then we'll have to wrap it up, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Marina Fazel, an Afghan American journalist. Uh, I would like to have two questions addressed. Um, there's been, along the years, obviously, a lot of talk about where the Taliban are getting military support, weaponry mainly. Uh, recently, there have been more allegations that Russia is becoming much more assertively involved in this. I would like your comments on that. In fact, um, Afghan media was reporting um, one of the 
Russian representatives having a laugh at this um, and saying that it's actually from the Afghan military, that all they have to do is to give Afghan military um, uh, the Taliban money. The, the Taliban just need money to go and buy the weapons from the Afghan military, suggesting the level of corruption. Hmm. The other question is, what would be your main recommendation to the Trump administration uh, if you had to condense, you know, send a brief message while the Afghan population is anxious about its future with all the ups and downs of these many troops and not many troops and at the height of it, as you mentioned, not really quite enough of a commitment to sustain a long-term uh, uh, stability to, for it to grow and then eventually become something that could be handed over to the Afghans as, uh, for them to independently handle. What would be your main recommendation to the Trump administration? What must be done to ensure stability in Afghanistan? Thanks. Okay. No, thanks. A good, really good questions, and I appreciate those. So the, I, as far as, as far as the Russian support, I, I don't know exactly like what, what exactly they may or may not be involved in. It's, I, I we never had any, anything that we uh, could directly attribute to them, but the, but what they do do, I think that's unhelpful is they, 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 they have a narrative that says, hey, we're, the, the you know, the Taliban is important to keep ISIS in, in check in Afghanistan. And I think the Russians really overblow the ISIS presence in Afghanistan. It's very small and very ineffective. And, and the Russians kind of talk about that as a reason that the Taliban is important. And that's, that's unhelpful. It's unhelpful for the region. It's unhelpful for the government of Afghanistan. And it's unhelpful for the, for the alliance. Uh, the fat part of the problem is still... Uh, the confluence of the uh, opium production and external support by regional actors, and that's that's the uh, the fat part of the problem in Helmand, and the most important thing that we need to address. Uh, as far as advice, I, I would give just based on my my time there would be is that uh, it's going to require a long term commitment uh, to to get the Afghan forces uh, where they need to be. Uh, we need to buy down the cap the the Taliban's capability. So we need to reduce the Taliban's capability and increase the Afghan uh, capability. And then we need to be committed to the long term. But also we, we need to do something that's affordable for our country and affordable for the alliance and the other donors. That, that all needs to be uh, kept in. Uh, so I, I think, uh, like I said earlier, the really the intersection between threat and capability and affordability, like we need to kind of set that, figure out what that level of investment needs to be in both resources and forces. And then we need to kind of stay with it until we've achieved the level of success. I want to thank not only everybody on the team of General Turner, but also our own Lieutenant Colonel Gerald Graham and Ian Livingston and others who helped set this up. I don't think I've learned as much in 60 minutes in this auditorium in a long time. Uh, there was a lot of information and a lot of hopefulness. So I really want to thank you for coming to Brookings, uh, General. Great.